The great thing about engineers is that we can take what people think are the biggest problems in the world and turn them into innovative advantages for civilization. And in today's episode of the Civil Engineering CEO, I have with me Anusha Oskuyan. Anusha is the president, CEO, and co-founder of Ship and Shore Environmental. And she's going to talk about how they've been able to take some of the things that people think are terrible for the world and make them environmentally friendly, but also help the world to leverage them to be more successful and really to have a cleaner environment in the future. But first, a word from our sponsor, Tensar. Check out Tensar Plus, the award-winning design software for construction professionals to design with geosynthetics and calculate their value on projects. Tensar Plus is simple to use with a powerful engineering system at its core. It leverages our decades of research and experience with soils all over the world, so you can count on your solutions working the first time, even in the most difficult conditions. Whether you're designing a crane pad or need to build a temporary road over muck, the cost, time, and carbon savings can be calculated, making comparison with alternatives simple. Specs, reports, and product data can be generated for your design. And training resources, research, and our third-party expert reviews are all provided conveniently in the software if needed. Usable both online and offline, the app is available in browser and on all major mobile platforms. Whatever you're working on, Tensar Plus is your toolbox for success. All right, now I'd like to welcome my guest onto the show for today, Anusha Oskuyan, President and CEO of Ship and Shore Environmental. Anusha, welcome to the Civil Engineering CEO. Um, lovely to be here, and thank you so much for having me on um, this conversational piece with you. Now, looking forward to it. So just to get us started, before we dive in, tell us a little bit about Ship and Shore Environmental. You know, how big is the company? Where are you located? What type of work do you do? Um, Ship and Shore Environmental is located in Long Beach, California, and uh, we have been here since year 2000. Um, we are a design engineering manufacturing company that provides anti-pollution control system for um, different types of industries from oil and gas, chemical, petrochemical, um, and solar manufacturers, um, car, battery, just all different types. Anyone that can potentially use um, any chemicals in their facility to make products. And if it becomes large enough of a quantity, they cannot send the emission out to the atmosphere, uh, which is governed by the EPA here in US, as well as a lot of local agencies. So we um, do the project from A to Z. Uh, from design all the way to execution and installation and verification. Um, our footprint goes all the way across to Canada and some every now and then Mexico. We have presence um, and a sister company in China um, that does um, projects and systems for China in China. So we have shared technology with them and our goal is truly to make sure that we um, tackle any type of pollution that gets out to the atmosphere. And our biggest motto is we do not have geographic boundaries in the air we have around our globe. Um, therefore, wherever we uh, manage to do projects, we, we just made our earth a better, cleaner place for all of us to be. That's great. And, and just roughly about how many employees do you have right now? We have um, we have about fifty um, right here on site um, in Long Beach. Um, we have uh, about fifteen twenty people across the country with respect to service and um, installation. Uh, we have a number of folks that are um, out and about that do um, start up of our systems. Um, so. Roughly speaking, we usually um, vary anywhere from about 80, 90 mm, folks, uh, below 100. Um, and that's here in US. And in China, our team is quite, um, quite extensive, about 25 people that work for the company. And they also have uh, various team members that um, go out and do the same type of work. And they have been set up with the same model as we have here. 
We also have just recently started working in India because that's another um, major spot on, on our globe that is um, um, quite polluted. And the government apparently is doing a lot more to um, enforce some of the rules and regulations in the area. Interesting. Interesting. So, so tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us about your career background and how, you know, Ship and Shore came about. Um, my background, I'm a, I'm a chemical engineer with um, studies of, um, towards my MBA while I was working at Floor Daniel. I used to work with um, Floor Corporation, a major EPC company. And after a number of years working there, I had an opportunity to explore a little bit and um, find out what else I could do. Back then I was a project engineer, project manager, and really getting to the, um, to designing a lot of various types of uh, projects. But I wanted to venture out and I had an opportunity to meet a gentleman who had done a lot of work in the environmental field. We started working at this company and moving fast forward in the year 2000 we had the i had the opportunity to um take ownership of an existing manufacturing facility and turning it into a complete engineering company um, that would do the design and engineering of the equipment that they were installing in the past um, and um, that's that's the background we started with 10 people total um, including myself, and I'm happy to say that we have just grown steadily over the years and um, lived through and survived through some downtimes that we've had in the country, um, but staying true to our uh, mission of um, trying to do environmental work uh, in the best light possible to keep manufacturing alive in U.S., yeah, that's great. That's interesting. So you worked for a manufacturing company and then you ended up co-founding a, a, a design, kind of a spin-off design company for that manufacturing company. So that's that's, right. that's an interesting path. So right. talk to me about the idea of going from working in the field as a technical professional right. to becoming a founder, a leader of a firm. Like how did that transition go for you? Like what were you confident in being able to make that transition? Did it require a lot of training? Tell us about that, that path for you to go from technical professional to leader. Um, I, I have to say I probably had the entrepreneurial um, side of me always at work, just like um, anyone else. You have to build upon your potential um, abilities. Uh, when I was working at, as an engineer, as a project manager, I always m wanted to do more, um, and it, it was not an easy. It was not an easy decision, um, and like a lot of other people that start venturing out into um, new eras, new areas, I um, um, I was. Um, fearful of, well, what am I going to do? How am I going to get through this? I, I knew about my engineering capabilities. Um, I did have leadership skills in managing projects, managing people, but um, taking it to the next level and actually being responsible for a um, number of people that were working for me at the time, start that with 10. Um, it took a lot of training, naturally, uh, personal training. Um, I would read and explore as much as possible. There's no um, one way of um, skinning the cat. Uh, but as time went on, one of the things that we really did focus on a lot was to um, run the company like a major, huge family um, setup that the family kept growing and growing and growing. And we still try to keep that same mentality in house here. We have some of our employees that have been with me from day one, which we'll take care of. And we, we, I love the idea of walking out there. The person started with us in the manufacturing. He was 20 and now he has his own family and grown kids. Uh, we have promoted education while um, some of the folks that were working here. Um, so is it easy? No. Uh, um, piece of cake? No. You have mm -hmm. your sleepless nights. You have your challenges. You have um, uh, but, but it just makes us stronger as we go through it, just like anything else in life. 
Yeah, for sure. For sure. And you, and you mentioned challenges. And I guess one of the things I wanted to ask you about is, you know, obviously while things may have improved in recent years, there's still a lot more men than women in the field of engineering. And for you, you know, as a woman, as a leader in the field, you know, how did that affect you as you grew in your career? Um, I'm sure that presented some challenges, but obviously you've, you've, been very successful. Talk a little bit about how it was to be be a woman at a young age lead, and turn into a leader in this field. Um, that is um, an interesting topic, which I usually talk, um, give a lot of presentations and talks to a lot of young girls in universities. I do a lot of mentorship to that effect. Um, I, uh, I believe one of the key um, uh, factors behind being able to walk through the challenges was I believed in what I was doing. I was confident of what I was able and capable of doing and performing. And naturally, um, I needed to make sure that my voice was being heard and I was being taken serious. When you do have the technical background and the entrepreneurial side, as well as being able to present the case, um, soon you'll grab attention of people that really need to listen. But I've been looked down upon just because I was a woman and walking into a major chemical plant, they're like, you're really going to walk this? Yes, I've done it before and I will do so. <laughs> do you really know what you're doing? I said, well, I guess we'll find out after an hour visit. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I've but I've developed a thick skin over the years because I truly and literally, there are days and weeks and months at times goes by that I only interact with gentlemen in a lot of different manufacturing facilities. And at most, maybe the administration is comprised of women. However, in the technical side, there are still a lot more men. Um, but by now we've developed um, a name for ourselves and a reputation. So um, I like to think we've overcome that, but never completely 100% there. Uh, we still encounter some folks that like to talk to a man rather than a woman. <laughs> yeah. No, and I think, I think, you know, you make a good point that at this point in time, you've obviously built up your name and that, you know, Ship and Shore's name. But like going back to early on in your career, like you were talking about, um, for those women out there that are, that are watching, that are viewing, you know, I think the key thing, like you said, is believing in yourself and having that confidence. I guess the question I would have for you is, you know, how does one build that confidence at a young age? Like, what would you recommend that they can do to help them become more confident in themselves? Um, I, you know, I wish there was one formula that everyone could follow. However, um, one of the things that I always mention is staying true to yourself and believing yourself and listening to your inner voice. We may, uh, we may be nervous as we're walking in, as I'm walking into a room of um, 15 engineers, men around the table, and I'm giving the presentation, but just, just knowing that I know much more about what I'm discussing and presenting than any one of them that is sitting there. And if, if, if you, we stay, I think as women, if we stay true to what we know, what we believe, and um, show the confidence in, the, in, in our presence, in our voice, in how we want to carry um, the conversation to the next level, people will, will, will listen. Um, it's, it's hard. It takes a lot of practice. doesn't mm. come easy, just like anything else. I um, normally, I do exercise as a person regularly and i always say you can't you can't be a bodybuilder the first time you walk into a gym you just have to work at it so this right. is something else that we just have to remind ourselves to to really listen to our own voice and if you have passion for what it is that you do and you really enjoy what you do that definitely comes across and i truly do believe um what we're doing is really making this world a better place for all of us to live and breathe yeah. And I think to your point, I think like, you know, you don't become confident overnight. You know, it is like That's you right. gain a little confidence, you gain a little bit more, you do something else. But I think one thing that I've seen or a couple of things that I've seen is one, I think that if you're a leader and you're leading a team and there are women on your team, you can definitely help 
them with their confidence by, you know, being very positive, supporting them, you know, helping them. I think that I think someone's manager can have a big impact in terms of their confidence. And I think also what I found to be helpful is if you're really learning your technical uh, content and, you know, understanding the technical aspects of your industry, it can help you when you go into a room and you have to deliver information that the better you know it, the more confident it can make you feel in like delivering it and getting it out there. That, that those, I think those can help you in some ways. Absolutely. Uh, all your points are totally right on. Um, uh, the more, the more you know about what it is you're trying to do and present and um, taking it from that point and building upon it would always be helpful. I do. Um, I, I, always um, wanted to have more women join our team and constantly working with them. Um, we do have one great example here at, you know, when she started originally, she was really nervous about even coming out and saying anything or expressing emails would come through, but the person really did not have the voice. And I, I, I made sure that we give her the opportunity and the chance to do so. And um, I'm happy to say that once that opportunity is given, a lot of women can definitely rise up to, to, to the top, as we see much more now in all different industries. Whereas when I think I started, um, there were very, very few. And even being hired back then at the major EPC company, they were hiring women just to meet a quota so they could get government projects. <laughs> right. um, this is this is how it was done and viewed long ago, but right now um, it's definitely much better and different. However, I have to also add this: at times I go to um, rural parts of the country where there is a facility I have to go and visit, um, and still with the older mentality of. Um, I was asked actually one time I walked into an office, they said, well, where are the engineers? I said, well, you're looking at her. <laughs> hmm. Like, oh, you're going to walk this plant? I said, of course. And um, they're like, well, do you have anybody else? I said, well, let us get through. Once we get the project, then I'll send the whole slew of engineers and other folks to visit you. They're like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, I, I, I see, I see that skepticism in their eyes and their voice, right. but then again, they, hopefully over time, the confidence is built up and it works well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you're right. I mean, I think we've made progress for sure, but there's more progress to be made. There are parts so of the country more. where we still, there's still a lot of stuff that can be done. Um, but again, it goes back to, like you said, you know, believing in yourself, regardless of the situation, you know, and, and doing what you, what you kind of know you can do. You mentioned earlier, you know, you have some employees that have been with you a long time. They have families, they're growing with you, which is great. Talk a little bit about, you know, the, kind of that balance between work and home. I mean, as a, especially as a leader, I know that there's so many different balls that you're juggling. Like how have you in your own life tried to kind of remain balanced as a leader, still having that personal, you know, life and downtime for yourself? Um, naturally, um, it definitely is a juggling act. If anyone turns around and says, I've mastered it, I just don't believe them. <laughs> just because I have to go through it and I see it. So um, if I'm really engaged in on the business side, on a particular project, on trips and so on and so forth, I definitely know the family life is suffering as a result. When I travel to China, uh, most often, which I started doing so as the country opened up just about a month or so ago. Um, naturally, I'm not with the family. And right. I work around the clock because I don't get myself adjusted to the time zone. So I, I, I'm usually working around the clock, trying to be in touch with folks here as well as um, um, in the office over there. Um, so at any given time, I believe one side of this multiple faceted um, life that we try to live will suffer a little bit as another side uh, picks up momentum. Um, staying healthy, trying to exercise and keep my mind focused definitely helps. Um, uh, I am uh, married and I do have a wonderful son who's in college. So I do play a mom. I do play the role of a wife. I do... Um, 
keep up with this and I'm very involved in the community. So I am um, just trying to stay focused on it and never losing the sight. Even if one side I believe um, is on the lower side of attention, um, I try to manage it by overcoming it when I'm back and try to put more focus on it. Not very easy, um, but, but it's definitely doable. And I highly recommend a lot of times um, when I have gone to colleges and talked to young girls, some of them say, well, I'd like to have a family. I don't know if I want to become an engineer. I don't know if that would be a path moving forward. And um, I believe our generation is nowadays um, thinking that it should be easy and maybe uh, I don't have to work that hard. But I always encourage them that, you know, it's not easy, but it definitely is doable and it's definitely manageable. Hmm. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think you're right. I think the thing about work-life balance that's important to remember, to your point, is that it's not like an engineering equation where you can just do the same thing and get the right answer. It's like there's always a lot of different variables. There's always a lot of stuff going on. You kind of just have to see how it is at each point in your career. And then, you know, some points you might have to do some more stuff at home. Some points you might have to do some more stuff at work. It just depends right. on, you know, what happens to be going on in your right. life at that time. So... You started at working at a manufacturing facility. You got into design, but you still do a lot of work in manufacturing facilities. You talked about the environment, you know, a lot of the good work you do around the environment. A lot of people will think this idea of manufacturing and the environment is like opposites and like manufacturing is bad. So talk a little bit about how that's not the case or that can be balanced. Talk about manufacturing versus environmental sustainability. Um, absolutely. Um, as as um, we are addressing the climate change issues that are really at the forefront of everything and sustainability, uh, one of the areas that I always encourage a lot of the um, companies that I consult with and eventually start doing the engineering project is if this is um, taken into consideration from um, phase one of doing the manufacturing, and you allow for what's uh, right to be done at this site to try to have your environmental issues under control, try to address the emissions, if you have any coming out of the facilities um, taken into consideration. You just have to plan for it and design it properly. Um, and it can easily be done. We walk into plants that are existing However, they have taken the initiative to become sustainable and environmental yeah, and in full compliance on the environmental side. And it can easily be um, changed. It could easily be modified naturally. A lot easier when you do it from the uh, starting point. Right now, we're engaged with a number of companies that are building a facility at another state, another location. So the first thing they uh, really... Uh, keep in mind is how do we make sure that we address the environmental issues, the emission issues, the sustainability issues, and have that be factored in. Uh, we definitely need to make sure we keep manufacturing alive um, in U.S. Um, during COVID time, we did notice that the supply chain issues, because we did not have all the manufacturing in U.S., they hurt us the most. Um, and I am a big advocate on behalf of manufacturers with respect to local agencies, naturally the one we have here in Southern California, um, to allow manufacturing to stay alive. Do not pass rules that is unbearable to live with, uh, but don't ever kill manufacturing. We shouldn't have companies to move from one state to the other because they think they can get away with it somewhere else. So it should all be um handled under the bigger umbrella of epa looking at the environmental and hazardous uh waste that is generated and should be controlled um so they definitely can go easily hand in hand and um, as long as it's um well thought through yeah no i'm glad you said that because i do think that the immediate reaction to manufacturing can be very negative but there's also a big positive side to the economy and jobs with manufacturing. And like you said, the supply chain issues wouldn't have been as bad if there was more manufacturing right locally. So I think it's a really good initiative to try to just create 
manufacturing that's not, you know, don't make it impossible for manufacturers to exist, but do make it in a way that they can be environmentally friendly, essentially. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's absolutely the case. And one of the other um, examples, if I may take this into that direction, um, for the longest time, um, public not knowing and just following um, a series of slogans, plastic is bad. Plastic is bad. Plastic is mm-hmm. not good. And people really, because I was very involved with, with a lot of plastics manufacturers, also on m- m- many different levels of plastics that we deal with, um, we can't replace plastics, but we need to make sure we address the issues they have and make sure their plants are totally environmentally friendly, as well as um, not kill the plastics industry. Plastics saved us throughout the COVID time. Uh, Packaging and um, uh, making sure, you know, from, from a lot of the uh, packages that we were receiving and other things, they were all wrapped into plastics. Mm. And it was, it really kept a lot of people going. And so I constantly remind people, you can't just go out and say, well, plastics are bad. Let's get rid of every plastic manufacturer in the country because plastics really um, do a lot of service for a lot of things we do. So that was just an example. Yeah, no, it's a good example because I think to your points, you know, there's a lot of things that people will react to as negative things like manufacturing or plastic, but they are forgetting about the positives that come out of those things. And I think as engineering professionals, we can try to come in and say, hey, listen, we want to kind of minimize the bad sides of this, but we want to build on the good sides of this and what we can kind of use it for in the long term. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's always ways. Leave it us. Leave it all up to us engineers to think of a solution, to think of a way to make things better. (laughs) Absolutely. So I know Ship and Shore Environmental is really interested in being innovative and creating innovative solutions. Can you talk about either a project or a technology that, you know, as an example around your commitment to environmental sustainability? Um, Absolutely. One of the, one of the um, areas that we do focus on, um, I may get technical for a minute or so. Um, as we collect all the emissions from the processes that take place in any manufacturing facility, these are what we refer to as VOCs, volatile organic compounds. Organic compounds all have heating value. So we take them through our system and all of this heat eventually is available as they go through the process and comes out of the stack or chimney of our equipment. So what we did was we started capturing all of that heat that is available to them. It's basically going out. So we said, we're turning all of your uh, VOCs into assets and brought the heat back to the plants. Mm. Um, They can use it for space heating. They can use it for process heating. We can generate steam for facilities that do need steam and require steam to use. Um, So that was one of the areas we were very effective. As a matter of fact, we were able to um, allocate a good part of a lot of the incentives that were available through different agencies throughout the country to come back to any manufacturer that does their project with efficiency in mind and bringing the heat back to the plant. so incentives were applied and as a result of doing this in a few different ways, few different um, designs that we had, um, it was most of their project was paid for by the government because as a whole, there is a, an initiative that's been out there for the longest time, reduce your utility consumption and try to uh, take advantage of what you have available. So that way the projects become incentivized. That's great. No, I love that. And I think it's really great because what you're doing is looking for areas where there's waste or people think it's waste, but create using it effectively and not wasting it and being able to re, you know, reallocate those resources to something positive, which is, which is great, which is something we need to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I wish there was major projects done and allocated. They're extremely um, expensive, but turning all of the waste we have, uh, waste to energy project, you know, all of the waste that goes sure. into landfill, all of the 
um, all of the bottles and plastic jugs and everything else that people just throw out, if that was ever sorted and done properly, it could, um, you know, it could save um, our lands from becoming landfills and generate energy and you can easily uh, generate um, electricity and power plants can be built. So, yeah, no, it's powerful stuff for sure. So I know you're big on community engagement and social responsibility. How have you kind of integrated those things into the culture at Ship and Shore? Um, I, I, naturally as a person, I have a few different areas that I, um, um, I like to enhance my life with. Um, so, uh, and I'm very involved in the community that I live as well as, um, trying to do mentorship programs. Um, so, uh, one of the areas that we have been very involved with is, um, allowing summer programs for some of the, um, high school students that we have had for the last few summers, they come in and do projects and we try to, uh, encourage them to go into engineering fields, which is great. And they see a lot of things here hands-on, uh, which is a great opportunity. I do a lot of mentorship at various universities and colleges that are around encouraging women to become engineers. And um, once they are here working right along the side with some of our engineers, um, the company sees that as well. Um, and um, they become encouraged to do to do the same type of a thing. We've had a number of our employees that have been with us for a long time. Their, their children, their kids, their daughters and sons have come here and have done that. Um, the work or at least the uh, internship for a while and eventually have selected to go that direction. Um, that's what we do. And uh, a lot of the folks here know that not only we work with universities in terms of my academics, in terms of involvement and also um, innovation. If uh, we have anything that we can share with them, with some of the colleges that are around, we'll do so. Um, That's great. And um, just, just trying to remain involved as much as we possibly can. And we're here in Long Beach. We've done some great projects at the port. Um, so every now and then, uh, we get involved with them and get some of our folks to to um, uh, know of all of the activities we have if they wanted to get involved themselves. That's great. No, and it sounds like you're also, you and other leaders in your company are leading by example, which is a great way to get people, you know, to take on some of those initiatives, which is great. All right. So, Anusha, the last question I have for you is if you had maybe one last piece of advice that you'd want to give to emerging leaders in the EPC sector, based on all of your experience, what would you tell them in their careers? Um, if I had to really, um, even though it may sound very cliche, but uh, believe in yourself believe in your own inner power and and stay true to yourself as well as the people that you are dealing with um and uh treating people with respect and having integrity in what you do um, really goes far and um i see it day in day out we have clients that we haven't seen for for years and perhaps decades I'll come back. Um, I actually had a chat with someone not too long ago. He says, I remember you from 20 years ago. And mm -hmm. I couldn't believe when I read this article about you. Um, and, um, and, and your sincerity really stayed with me. So some of the good qualities um, that a human being should have, um, sometimes every now and then in the uh, fast pace of life, we forget. Uh, but more than anything else, truly um, stay true to yourself and believe in yourself. That's great. Well, Anusha Oskuyan, President and CEO and co-founder of Ship and Shore Environmental, I want to thank you so much for spending some time with us here on the Civil Engineering CEO. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity and giving us the, uh, giving us the voice to, to share our story.
I hope you found this episode interesting. I mean, to me, I really loved when Anusha talked about the idea of, you know, you have to build confidence in yourself, especially for those female engineers out there. And you need to do it by building momentum. But also when she talked about this idea that, you know, people think manufacturing is terrible or plastics terrible. And while there may be bad aspects to it, as engineers, we can try to find the good in there, take the good out of it and help civilization to really leverage it. If you enjoyed the episode, please consider subscribing to our channel here. We put out videos like this on a weekly basis to help engineers become better managers and leaders. I'll see you next week.